God controls everything, even specific days like the Passover. And if this is true, then we can be assured that he controls every day of ours also. So today I want to talk about how comforting that is, knowing that even the days when we feel rejected by someone or something that happened in our life, we can be assured that God is in that too. Join us today. All right, good morning. Welcome to our Acts in 10-ish series where we're trying to bring you Acts in a, a 10 to 15 minute little segment. So um, for those of you that don't have a lot of time, you can still study the Word of God, maybe on your way to work, listening to a podcast, whatever that looks like. So we're glad you're joining us today. Uh, the last lesson, we talked about a man by the name of Barsabbas, and I want to continue along that line talking about him again today for a few minutes. And I want to add a few thoughts to what we talked about last week, because we kind of went a completely different way. Mostly because I was wondering if Barsabbas felt rejected by God. Because at this particular time, we'll read the verse in a second, there was, uh, Judas had just been, of course, he went and hanged himself and, and now there's only 11 disciples. So they wanted to get a 12th disciple. And so they cast a lot. And I always say that that's kind of like flipping a coin and just going, okay, God, you are in charge of heads or tails. So we're going to flip the coin. You make sure that, you know, if it's heads or tails, you make sure it says the right thing. And that's how, when they cast a lot, this is how they would know who God wanted for for this position because there was two men that were up for it, a man by the name of Matthias and Barsabbas. But we see that Matthias was chosen, Barsabbas wasn't. And it made me think about all the times in our life when we feel rejected, we look, feel, feel overlooked. We, feel, we just like, God, do people not like me? I mean, that's kind of how we feel. But then I took it a step further and thought, Barsabbas is being kind of rejected by God. And that even would be even more sad. So let's go back to those verses. Acts 1.23 says this, And they accordingly proposed or nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots and the lot fell on Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Now I think of 2000 years later where we are today, when I read this story, it just, it's kind of an encouraging word for me that sometimes being rejected is God's way of moving us someplace different, somewhere where he, somewhere where he needs us. Because what we learn from the story is Barsabbas wasn't supposed to be an apostle. That God really had another plan for him to do something different that, that didn't include being part of the 12. So then I started thinking, what if we could look at life like that? Like you pray for that promotion and then you don't get it. And you just feel completely rejected and dejected. And, and, and I don't want us to feel that way anymore after reading this story about Barsabbas. How about you pray for a great marriage, but your husband leaves you. Now you feel rejected by your husband. You pray for this specific guy to marry you, and then he dumps you, and then you feel rejected by him. But it's this idea that, no, 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 as a follower of Jesus, God is in each one of those things. Every time you're rejected, that's God protecting you. I, I laugh because our, our kids growing up, of course, they would date people and then someone would break up with them or whatever that looked like. And, and they would come tell me and they would cry and I'm not that compassionate. So I would always say, yay, that's awesome. And they would be crying. And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, this is the best news ever. God has just saved your life. He saved the path that, you're, that you were going on. He's, he's got you back on the right path again. Cheyenne and I were talking, we were talking to a friend at church one time and Cheyenne said, you know, when I call my mom, sometimes I just want her to cry with me. I want her to take my side. I want her to feel sorry for me. But instead, she, she doesn't do that. She always says, you know what? God's got this. He knows what he's doing. 
And Cheyenne told this friend, she goes, I, I hate that when my mom does that. <laughs> but I laughed and I told her that's because I have like 30 plus years on you. And I've been able to look back at the same situations that you're going through and see God's hand in them all. And what I thought was such a heartache and so sad and I was being rejected back then, I look now and I see how God saved me and protected me. And so what if we can look at rejection with God glasses on? Because when we can look at life through the eyes of God, I really believe we'll never feel overlooked and rejected. We don't have to feel sorry for ourselves anymore. Because as a Christian, we have to look at things and life completely different than, than anyone else thinks. Because following Jesus really honestly is opposite from what the world says. I'll give you some examples. The world says if you want to be great, you need to climb to the top of the ladder. Others need to serve you. But then Jesus comes along in Matthew 23, 11 and says, no, nope, the greatest among you must be your servant. We're like, what? The second one, the world says you should never have to suffer. You shouldn't have to suffer. Your life should go good all the time. But the Bible says this in Philippians 1, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. That's like normal Christianity 101. How about this one? The world says, get rich and have lots of stuff. But Jesus says this in Matthew 16, 26. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet he forfeits his soul? I don't know. We might want to think about that. How about number four is this. The world says this. Look out for me. Look out for me. But the Bible says this in Galatians 2, carry each other's burdens, thus fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, let's stop worrying about us and start caring more about others. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Here's another one, number five. The world says, you're in charge of your future now. Go make it happen. But Jesus says this in Luke 22, 42. He says, Father, if you're willing to take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done, O Lord. See, our future needs to be attached to God's will. God, what do you want for my life? Not, I'm in charge and I'm going to go do this. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't step out and try things if we feel like God's leading us. But we also know that he can open that door or shut that door anytime he wants to. Because our heart is, we want what you want, God, over what I want. Another one is this. The world says, hold on to this life as long as you can. But Mark 8.35 says, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for, my, for me and the gospel will save it. It's not like, hang on to this life. It's like, no, our life now is about serving Jesus. That, that's what, that when we become a Christian, that's what it's supposed to mean. The world says this, we'll say this is number seven. Uh, don't get mad, get even. Get even with people, you know. You didn't deserve that. You should get back at them. But Matthew 18 21 says this, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Up to seven times. And Jesus said, I'll tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven. He's saying, look, let's not get even with people. Let's forgive them. That's what it means when you follow Christ. How about this one? The world says, never let anyone take advantage of you. But Jesus said this in Matthew 541, 540. If someone wants to sue you to take your tunic, give him your coat as well. It's like, you know what, God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to live, I'm going to trust you with this situation. It's not this matter of, I'm not going to let someone take advantage of me. It's like, you know what, I'm going to do everything I can to love this person and be there. And, and, and that's just, it's the difference between what the world says and what the Bible says. The world says this, never let anyone disrespect you. But Jesus says in Matthew 5 39, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Okay, now there's deeper meanings to those last two, but the point is this, is that when you follow Jesus, he says to do things differently than the people that are in the world. So if Bersabbas can get rejected from God and hold his head up and not feel sad and not feel dejected and not just, you know, go eat five pints of ice cream, um, we should be able to do the same thing. We should be rejected and be like, God, you're doing something. This is kind of cool. Do you see how that plays out? Now, moving on. The disciples now have been waiting 10 days. Uh, they were waiting for the power that would begin the birth of the church. 
This made me laugh. A Sunday school teacher asked the kids in her class as they were, um, asked her little children as they were on their way to a church service. She was trying to explain like, hey kids, um, you know, I'm going to go teach Sunday school, but we're going to be in church. So uh, you kind of need to be quiet. Why kids do we need to be quiet in church? And one of the little girls replied and said, well, that's because people are sleeping. <laughs> I was like, but here, no more sleeping in the church, okay? Not after this, because what they were waiting for is what we know as the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit would come and give power, and we'll see that in our lesson next week. But what we want to know, understand is that, that there's 120 people in the upper room waiting for this. And when the Holy Spirit shows up, it's going to change everything. Because now the people that are, that are following Jesus will be filled with the Spirit and they will have boldness to go into the world and tell others about Him. So I want to finish off really quick with some amazing history and show you why God is intricately involved, not only in this world and in your life and mine, but even calendar days and Jewish holidays. And, and because Passover was a big deal, and it's amazing that Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead. Let's look at this picture right here. Look at where it says Passover. Jesus died on a cross and was buried and rose from the dead over Passover. I mean, if you really think that through, out of all 365 days of the year, that God made sure that all of this happened on Passover. And the reason why is because the Passover connects Jesus all the way back to Moses in Exodus. Someone said this, it made me laugh. They said, Passover is just like Easter, except without the Easter bunny, without bonnets, without colored eggs, or even actually without the New Testament. <laughs> because Passover was actually a Jewish holiday that commemorated all the way back in Exodus when the Israelites were stuck in Egypt. Moses comes along, tells Pharaoh, let my people go. But of course, Pharaoh did not. Through a series of plague after plague, like frogs and hail and lice and flies and boils and locusts and darkness, they, it was like Pharaoh's heart needed to be softened to let the Israelites go. But he wouldn't. None of those horrible things moved Pharaoh's heart. But then there was the final plague, which God said this, your firstborn son will die whether it was your servant Pharaoh or your cattle. I mean, that's just the way it was. But God said this, unless you do this, unless you take the blood of a lamb and you take the blood and you put it over your doorpost. And on that night, the angel of death will pass over your house. And if you have that blood, he'll pass over. If not, your firstborn will die. That's, this is what the Passover was all about. But it took a lamb and it took blood. And that is exactly what Passover is about when we get to this whole idea of Jesus in the New Testament. Because what they did by putting lamb's blood over their doorposts points us to what Jesus would do for us. Because John calls Jesus the Lamb of God. He will die on a cross. He will pay for our sins. And his blood on the cross is like that lamb's blood over the doorpost. And when we give our life to Jesus, what happens, we say, we give us our life to him and his blood, it's like his blood covers us. And so when it comes time to, to God saying, who's going to spend eternity with me? And, and, and he sees Jesus's blood covering us, then, then we're accepted in. It's so fascinating. But I always think it's, it's amazing that, that uh, like I said, all the weeks and months of the year, Jesus dies at the exact day that he's supposed to because it's Passover. It's about remembering. So today I want us to remember. I want us to remember just like Jesus died on a specific day. Passover is a very important Jewish holiday. But my point is I want you to understand that God is that much in control of everything in this world, every single day. And if he's that intricately involved in, in Passover and what day Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead, I want you to be assured that he's intricately involved in every day of your life also. And there will be days that you feel rejected. Because I bet Jesus did. I bet he felt rejected by the Jewish nation and the Romans. But he knew this. He knew God was in control. And he knew God had a plan and a purpose 
for his rejection. And we're thankful that Jesus was rejected because now because of that, we have an opportunity to spend eternity in heaven with him. Hope that helped today give a little bit more clarity and next week we'll see how Pentecost changes the face of Christianity forever. Have a good week. Thank you.